Good morning. Good to see all of your smiling faces today. Thank you for coming out. Thank you for coming out to our church today. Victory Church at beautiful Chattanooga. T- Hold on just one moment. Victory Church in beautiful Chattanooga, Tennessee, America's scenic city. We appreciate you being with us. Had a mild technical difficulty there. Happy pre-eclipse day. That would be tomorrow. I would like for you to turn with me in your Bible this morning, please, to the book of Acts, chapter 1. Now, last week, uh, actually, we're coming, last Sunday was Easter, and we are coming off now two weeks on talking about the Easter story. Um, we if we talked about the triumphal entry. We talked about the uh, crucifixion. We talked about uh, the resurrection. And what we're going to do this morning is just continue in the story. The story didn't end. Okay. I mean, I, I mean, if if we'd have stopped the story after the resurrection, it still would have been good. Okay. We could stop it right there, and everything would be great. But there's more to it and and things that apply to us. And I want to look at those things because this is a particular area uh, that I think is overlooked and I think it's significant. And one of the reasons that I think it's significant is because there's a lot of information on this in our Bible. You know, each one of the Gospels, or or, or, excuse me, uh, not all of the Gospels have an account of the birth of the Lord Jesus. But every one of them have an account of the crucifixion and every one of them have an account of the time that he was here after the the, uh, crucifixion and resurrection. Wait a minute, you mean he was here? Yeah, that's what we're going to look at this morning. Let's let's take a look at this here in Acts chapter one. Um, We can uh, we can just begin reading in verse one. Remember that the writer of the book of Acts is Luke, the same one that wrote the gospel of Luke. The former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach, until the day in which he was taken up after he, through the Holy Spirit, had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom he also presented himself alive after his sufferings by many infallible proofs. Now that word infallible there is a Greek word that we get our word criteria from. After many infallible proofs, being seen by them during 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Okay, this gives us a very interesting clue right here. Uh, Luke says that Jesus was seen after his resurrection 40 days. Is that what your Bible says? And it says that he was seen by 500, uh, or excuse me, Apostle Paul says he was seen by 500 people, which. Uh, that's over in 1 Corinthians 15, 6. Actually, it says he was seen by 500 people in, at one time. So we know there were more, more people that he came in contact with. From what we can tell, there may have been more, but we don't have that recorded. From what we can tell, the largest group that he appeared to would have been about 500 people. Now let's continue reading here in verse 4. And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, You have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Now this is new. This has not happened before. We, we have had, and, and this, we're going to be talking about this in detail two weeks from today. So th- this is something that's very significant. You see, in the Old Testament, the Spirit of God could come up on people. That anointing could come up on people. And it typically came up on three different groups of people. It came up on kings, it came up on priests, and it came up on prophets. Now there are a few other examples in the Bible of, of the power of God, the anointing of God coming on others, but primarily those are the three groups of people that experienced the anointing or the power of the Spirit of God in the Old Testament. Now, that's about to change. Because on the day of Pentecost, and this, we, to us today, this is, this is just something we're used to. 
You understand back then, when this happened on the day of Pentecost, this had never happened before. This was brand new. And I better stop because I'll get into my teaching on two weeks from now down the road. So he told them, he said, I want you to go and, and I want you to wait in Jerusalem because you're going to be, John baptized with water, but you're going to be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Now you remember John said himself, he, he said, I baptize with water, but there's coming one after me that will baptize you with the Holy Ghost and fire. Now, the Bible tells us that uh, over in Ephesians that there is one faith, one Lord, and one baptism. So, if I have to choose which baptism I'm going to go with, it's the baptism of the Holy Ghost and fire that I'm going to go with. And I know that can make some people upset um, uh, where water baptism is concerned. Listen, water baptism is good. It's an ordinance of this church. We practice water baptism here. But uh, it, the Bible says very clearly that there is a baptism that the believer is supposed to have, and that is with the Holy Spirit. It's an endowment of power. And I am going to stop here because I am slipping over into my sermon that I'm teaching into it. All right. Verse 6, Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, It's not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father has put in his own authority. But you, so, so he now gets back on subject, okay? They, he was telling them, you go to Jerusalem and wait. John baptized the water, you're going to be baptized. with." And so they interrupt him with this question, so now he's back on, on track, verse 8. But you shall receive power... When the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, and all Judea, and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. Verse 8 is an extremely important verse of Scripture in our Bible. This, it, it, and, and I am, I'm sad to say, it is a passage of Scripture that the church today has forgotten. It's a passage today that most of the church world today is not practicing. You know, you have to be careful. Uh, I was thinking about that this, this, this week. Um, you have to be careful when reading your Bible that you don't read your Bible to justify the way that you believe. See, there, there are a, a, a lot of people that, re, in other words, if you, if you I'm just going to use ex, uh, an, an example here, okay? And, and it, it can apply to any group of people. If, if you go to the Baptist church, then typically you will read your Bible in a way that justifies why you believe the way Baptists believe, or why you believe the way Presbyterians believe, or why you believe the way Methodists believe, or Episcopalian, or Catholic, or whatever, Church of God, whatever, uh, Church of Christ, whatever denomination you are, typically people will read the Bible with those glasses on. I remember years ago, 1979, I made a decision. And that decision was that I was going to read the New Testament of the Bible clean, fresh, and anew. And as I was reading through the New Testament, I, was, I made the decision, I am going to... Now, this is pretty good. I mean, this, this, this is, you know, for, for a, however old I was, 20-something. Uh, I made the decision, I am going to do my best as I am reading through here to make this my standard and me act like this instead of me acting the way that I want to act or believing the way that I want to believe and then making the Bible conform to me. See, that, that to me is backwards. And it, it, it gets people in trouble. And, and what do you understand? It is a tactic of the enemy, a tactic of, of uh, religion to take away this verse of Scripture from the church. Do you understand the devil doesn't care what you believe? So long as you leave him alone. So long as you don't interfere with his plan, which is still the same plan that he's had ever since we see it, we encounter him in Genesis. His plan is still to exalt his throne above God. That's what he's trying to do. 
And you find all the way through the book of Revelation that's what he's trying to do. I have good news. If you read the end of the book, you will find that he does not succeed. But he thinks that he does. So you understand the devil understands more about the authority of the church than the church does. And so one of his tactics, one of his strategies is to, okay, you know, y'all get together and play church all you want to. And, you know, kumbaya, Michael, row your boat ashore, you know, do whatever you want to do. Just don't have any power. Don't exercise any power or authority over me. And so there's all kinds of things that have gotten into there. We, we have, uh, uh, the, you know, the, the teaching of sovereignty. Now, um, okay, I'm not, I'm not going to get into this deep this morning. But where sovereign is God sovereign? Well, yes, of course He is. He's the creator of the universe. He is the almighty God, creator of heaven and earth. Is He sovereign? Yes. However, He gave part of that sovereignty to man. And we messed it up. So, when you talk about the earth, and you talk about sovereignty on the earth, the, the person, the, the, the ruler on the earth is man. And you, I mean, this is written in your Bible very clearly in Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 through 28. You have to put on those glasses I was telling you about earlier to misunderstand that. It says very clearly that He's given man dominion and authority. It tells you in chapter 3, that man took that dominion and authority and gave it to a fallen archangel, Lucifer. So now who has dominion and authority on the earth? Lucifer. Now that seems real simple to me. But if somebody doesn't understand that and they still think, well, God is sovereign in the earth today, brother. He's sovereign in the earth. Now then you have to develop a whole line of believing of why God is allowing all this stuff to happen. He's in charge, but He's just allowing sin, sickness, poverty, destruction, all this stuff to happen. Well, I have to tell you, to me, that's worse. If you could do something about it and you just simply choose not to do it, it helps. And so what happens is the segment that is, that is missed, that is so very important, and it's talking about this here in verse 8, and that is the enemy does not want the church to know about their authority and power that God has given them. The church. He just looks at it as you, you play all your little games, you have all your little fellowships, you sing all your little songs, you have all your stained glass windows, you have all your whatever, you have all your committees and commissions and stuff like that, and y'all just have a great time, just don't bother me. Just don't interfere with my plan. And so that's kind of what has happened to a large portion of the church today is they don't understand that the author- God has given authority in the earth to man. Jesus died on the cross as a man. He was God, but He was God in man, God in a body. And that's how that price was paid. And so that authority that Adam lost, Jesus now has it back. And I taught on this last week. Uh, This is what right, right before he was raised up, that's what happened. Is the authority that God had given Adam in the garden now has come back to man. Man now has that authority back. And so when you're operating in the kingdom of God, there is still a lease that's given to man in general on the earth. But if you're operating in the kingdom of God, you have that authority and that power available to you while you're here on the earth. And that's just not taught very much. So who is it that would not want you to understand that you have authority and that you have power available to you well it would be the enemy so he tells them he said i want you to go and wait in jerusalem and you wait there until you received power now this word power is the word that you would think it would be and this is the word this is our old buddy dunamis 
And dunamis is the word that is the miracle working power of God. This is the power of God that was released when, when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. This is the power of God that parted the Red Sea. This is the power of God that opens blind eyes, that causes the lame to walk. This is the miracle working dynamic power of the living God. That's the word that's used in this. He said, I want you to go wait to Jerusalem. Apparently, they don't have it yet. Now, they could operate it in it some when they were with him. Remember, he sent the disciples out, and then he sent the 70 out. So those were just uh, uh, precursors to what is going to happen and be available to the whole church. Now, you go wait there until you've received this power. He's told us in the other four Gospels what we call the Great Commission. And the Great Commission is to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And these signs will follow you that believe. So the signs that, are, that we're told are following, uh, are, are, you, know, we're, we're, you know, raising the dead, healing the sick, casting out devils, all of those things are the things that he did. And he told us, he said, the things that I do, you're going to do also. So he says, you're going to be able to do this, but you wait till you get that power before, don't jump out there before, you wait till you get the power before you do it. And, and remember, the, pers- the, the purpose of the power is not so that we can build, so that a person can build their own ministry. The purpose of the power is to be a witness so that other people see that as an example. You, you know, that's what happened where Jesus was concerned. Jesus had the same pattern when he went into towns. When he, went pre- he would go into their towns, he would preach in their synagogues, and then he would heal the sick. He would go in and teach, and he would teach what we find over in Luke chapter 4, the Spirit of the Lord's upon me because he's anointed me. He would preach that same sermon. That was his lead-off sermon everywhere that he went. And when he went into town, and as they believed it, as they received it, then it's when he would pray for the sick. Now, there are a few other occasions that Jesus, would, you know, we, I'm thinking one example where he messed up a funeral. He's, you know, a funeral procession comes by and he prays and raises the boy up. Uh, and and there, there are a few other things like that. You have the Pool of Bethesda and, and some others. But primarily his way of doing things was he would go in and teach. He would go in and teach. He would go in and teach. In case you haven't figured it out, teaching is really important. You won't grow without being taught. Because the way that we grow, the way that faith comes to us, is by hearing the Word of God. And that's what he would do. He would go and teach. And when he did that, as he would go and teach, what would happen? Faith would come. And it was easier for him to minister. Well, I don't know why it had been hard for Jesus to minister. Jesus could do whatever he wanted to. Well, you know, I mean, I, I'm recalling the Bible. He went to his hometown, and the Bible says there he could do no mighty work. And, he, and the Bible said, and he marveled. Now, you know, that's an interesting phrase right there. Jesus you know, he, we, we see him say, when, he sees, uh, when, when Jesus marvels at somebody's faith, Oh, daughter, great is your faith. I hadn't seen faith like this, no, not at all, of Israel. So that's, that's good to be on that end. But imagine him marveling at their unbelief. He was astounded at their unbelief. Now, he was just as much the Son of, son of God that day as he was any other day. But they could not get the pat, past the point that this was Joseph and Mary's boy. Couldn't get past that. You, like we alluded to last week, and we're going to be getting into it some today and next week. You understand the people that were around Jesus didn't understand what was going on. They didn't understand who he was. Some would think that he was the Messiah. They hoped he was the Messiah. But they came around him because of the works. 
They came around him because people were healed. They didn't understand that he was the Lamb of God that was going to take away their sin. They didn't know what taking away their, their sin was. They didn't know how that was. They didn't know that this was God, Jehovah, in flesh. They didn't know that. As a matter of fact, the disciples didn't know. This was primarily Paul's revelation. So what we find here, he tells them, he said, you go wait in Jerusalem until you receive power from on high. You're going to be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and in the uttermost or the end of the earth. Now when he had spoken these things, while they watched, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? The same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go up into heaven. Now I want you to notice in verse 9, it says, Now when he had spoken these things while they watched, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. Virtually every Bible scholar that I have seen believes that this cloud here was the Old Testament saints that had come out of the graves after His resurrection. Now, what we have just read here for these several verses of Scripture, we have just seen in, in, in a very short period of time that Jesus, after the resurrection, was on the earth. He was seen on the earth. He was seen, according to the Apostle Paul, by over 500, or by 500 people. And then he also says in, in, in that particular passage of Scripture that he, that he was seen, uh, um, actually, turn there with me. You can turn there with me, look at it in your Bible. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 3. These go together. I want you to see this passage. Luke just gave you in 11 verses what happened in 40 days. Okay? So he tells you that he was, he was seen, he resurrected, he was seen, and then he was taken up in a cloud. 1 Corinthians 15, we'll start in verse 3. For I delivered to you first of all, which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. People didn't know that. They didn't know that Jesus was dying for their sins. They didn't understand it. And that He was buried, and that He arose again the third day, according to the Scriptures, and that He was seen by Cephas, that's Peter, then by the twelve. After that, He was seen by over 500 brethren at once. Okay, by over 500 brethren. So He's seen by Peter, and then He's seen... With Peter and the other apostles, he's seen by over 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain to the present. But some have fallen asleep. That, that's a euphemistic expression of they've died. After that, he was seen by James, then by all the apostles. Then last of all, he was seen by me also, as one born out of due time. So, what has happened is, and I want you to go ahead and, and uh, uh, well, before we go, I want you. Have any of you in here ever invited somebody to come to church? Anybody? Anybody invited people to come to this church? Thank you, the three of you that raised your hand. I appreciate you trying to help with that. Okay. I, all of you, I assumed at some point, have invited somebody to come to church here. Well, do you realize that Jesus only had 24% success rate? I mean, if we conservatively look at 500 people, now you know more people than that saw him. What do you think he's telling the 500 people? Hey, listen. Won't you go to Jerusalem and wait till you receive power from on high? You're not going to want to miss this. Clear your calendar. You're going to want to be in Jerusalem and receive power from on high. I'm, I don't want to give a whole lot away. But it's going to happen around, it's going to happen around, well, it starts with a P and ends in Intecost. Okay? 
So it's going to happen around the end. So uh, you go and wait there, and you're going to receive power from on high. You know he was, he was sharing that with people. And he told at least 500 people, and only 120 showed up. That's 24% success rate. So you mean to tell me that even... Let's think about this. How many people have you heard today say, if Jesus were just standing here right now, let me help you with the last part of that sentence, nothing would change. The risen Christ appeared to them and said, go to Jerusalem and wait. 380 had something else to do. You know, soccer practice, I'm sure. PTA meeting. Homeowners Association meeting. My dear Lord, we only have one of those a year. Can't miss that. I'm running for office this year. All kinds of things came up. Now you know when he was standing there in front of him and said... Go to Jerusalem and wait. You know every one of them when they heard that. said, I'm going to be there. I tell you what, there is nothing that can make me not be there. And then when he leaves and they're not in his presence, what happens? That dissipates. You know that still happens today. Still happens today. Okay. Matthew chapter 28. We're going to start with these, and I'm going to look in Matthew's gospel and Mark's gospel, and then we're going to uh, uh, go to Luke's gospel. It, 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 we're we're going to go in order with these. So Matthew chapter 28, verse 1. Now after the Sabbath, by the way, you may want to make a note that I think is significant. This word Sabbath in this particular verse of Scripture is plural. Now, after the Sabbaths. So that would be the weekly Saturday Sabbath. And also, as we learned a few weeks ago, that would also be the Feast of Unleavened Bread which was the Sabbath that Jesus had to be taken off the cross before it came. It's talking about. Okay. Now, after the Sabbath, as the first day of the week began to dawn, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door. His countenance was like lightning and his clothing as white as snow. And the guards shook for fear of him because and they became like dead men. But the angel answered and said to the women, Do not be afraid. For I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He's not here. For he has risen as he said. Come see the place where the Lord lay. And go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. And indeed he has gone before you into Galilee. There you will see him. Behold I have told you. So they went out quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy. And ran and told his disciples the word. And as they went to tell his disciples. Behold. Jesus met them and said to them, Rejoice, or literally all hell. So they came, and they, and they held him by his feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brethren to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. Notice at this part he doesn't say, Don't touch me, for I have not yet ascended to my Father. So he is gone and come back. And now... The price has been paid in its entirety, and Jesus is now the high priest of the new covenant. And he's back on the earth. Now while they were going, behold, some of the guard came into the city, reporting to the chief priest all that had happened. Uh, so they, they, they've seen him here. Notice that, uh, and this is going to get, this can get confusing. I, I spent an hour or an hour and a half 
trying to figure out the Marys. And I have to tell you what I came to the conclusion of. We're not going to know till we get to heaven. Okay, we're just not going to know. The, you understand in, in, in John 19.25, there's three Marys at the cross. There's Mary, the mother of Jesus. There's Mary Magdalene. And then there's just simply called the other Mary. Now the other Mary is Mary, the mother of Jesus' sister. So you have Mary, the mother of Jesus, and her sister Mary. You don't think that wasn't confusion around the house? And then some believe that the other Mary was Mary, the mother of James. Okay, which James? So now you've got a Mary that you don't know which Mary, she's a Mary, and, and so she's the mother of James. Oh, that really helps us. Are we talking about James, Jesus' brother? Are we talking about James the lesser? Are we talking about James, John's brother? Which James are we talking about? It doesn't help. Now then, to even make matters even more challenging, Mary, the mother of Jesus, her, her name is actually Miriam. Do not tell that to your Catholic friends. It will mess them up. Okay? Mary, okay. Jesus, when Jesus was growing up and His mother called Him to supper, what did she say? Did she say, Jesus! No. No. She said, we would say, Joshua. But that's not the way. She said, Yeshua. Or Yahshua. Because Jesus' name is Joshua. You know, just like the Joshua in the Battle of Jericho. That same name. And when they went and visited Spain or Tarsus, he was Jesus. Okay? That... So we, we have Americanized it, or English, is Jesus. But His name is Yahshua, or Yeshua, depending on how you want to pronounce it. Yeshua, Joshua, is, is His name. Mary is actually Miriam. If, you were, if you're talking in Hebrew or, or uh, uh, Aramaic, it's Miriam. The other Mary's names are Maria. So you have... Miriam and Maria and Maria, and they're all in our English Bible called Mary. So, the conclusion that I came to after approaching two hours trying to run this down was, it doesn't matter. It just, it just doesn't matter. So, they were at the cross Two Marys, and, and one Mary Magdalene is identified, okay, is one of them. Two Marys, so Mary Magdalene and some other Mary or Maria, they come to the tomb and then they go and tell the disciples. All right, look over with me in Mark's Gospel, chapter 16. Verse 1. Now, when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, see, she's in a, Mary, the mother of James, I was telling you, see, Mary, okay, Mary, the mother of James, which James? And Salome bought spices that they might come and anoint him. Very early in the morning, on the first day of the week, they came to the tomb when the sun had just risen, and they said among themselves, who will roll away the stone for the door of the tomb, the door of the tomb for us? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone had been rolled away, for it was very large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man clothed in long white robes sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you into Galilee. Therefore you will see him as he said to you. So they went out quickly 
and, and fled from the tomb, for they trembled and were amazed, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. Do you notice in both of these accounts so far that the angel has told them to go somewhere? That Jesus has gone somewhere? Where is He gone? To Galilee. That's in the north. That's away from Jerusalem. Now, I believe the reason this has happened is, is this. You have to realize what's going on in Jerusalem right now. After the crucifixion of Jesus, to put it, <clears throat> to put it mildly, there are some questions. There were some unusual happenings. Never before had they crucified somebody, and as he was dying, the sun quit shining. Never before, when they were crucified, had there been an earthquake. The centurion that was, or the Roman that was crucifying him said, Surely this was a righteous man. The thieves recognized that he was the Son of God. Well, don't you know that the people that were out there that were watch, watching this, and as word began to spread, there were things that were being spread of, you know, we made a mistake. This, this was Him. And, and so now there's starting to be conflict and turmoil in the Sanhedrin, among the Pharisees. And probably among the priests. We know that Nicodemus was one of the ones that came with Joseph of Arimathea that took Jesus' body. He, he was a Pharisee. So, you have questions and doubts. Uh, uh, the, the, it, it's, it's very unstable. Now, if that's not enough, we looked at this last week in Matthew's Gospel. And after His resurrection, the graves were opened. And the Old Testament saints began walking the streets of Jerusalem. Now, will you think about that for just a minute? You put that, you put that in today's parlance. You put that today's reality TV show. What would we call that today? We would call that today a zombie apocalypse. Right? I mean, come on. What would happen in Chattanooga, Tennessee, if all of a sudden, down at the National Cemetery, those graves opened up? Say only half of them came out of their graves and started walking in downtown Chattanooga. Do you think that would make the news? Do you think that that would make national news? Do you think that would make world news? Yes, because that's just something that doesn't happen every day. Are, 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 are you listening? Do you realize graves opened up and dead people came out? And walked the streets of Jerusalem. Well, what do you think they were saying? They were telling about what they had just witnessed in hell. Jesus was, in fact, the Messiah. He defeated death, hell, and the grave. Okay? So, right now, Jerusalem has a pretty good witness that things are going on, right? So, Jesus tells His disciples to go meet Him in Galilee. The spotlight's not as bright there as it is in Jerusalem. And so he goes and meets with his disciples, and he starts teaching them. 
And if you'll look with me here in Luke's Gospel, 24, I want to look at, at this for a moment, and we're going to close here and then pick it up next week. But there is a point that I want to get to where this is concerned. So in Luke chapter 24, verses 1 through 12, is the resurrection scene at the tomb. I want you to pick it up with me in verse 13. Now behold, two of them, two of who? Two of His disciples. <clears throat> Not necessarily the twelve. You remember Jesus had more than twelve disciples. But we know that He had at least seventy. <clears throat> Now behold, two of them were traveling the same day to a village called Emmaus, which was seven miles from Jerusalem. It is west of Jerusalem. And they talked together of all the things which had happened. Okay, so you understand, these are just two men that are traveling, and they're talking about the events that have just transpired in Jerusalem this past week. I'm sure it was on the minds and lips of every person in Jerusalem was talking about it. And they talked together all these things that happened. So it was that while they conversed in reason that Jesus Himself drew near and went with them. So Jesus shows up. But their eyes were restrained so that they did not know Him. And He said to them, What kind of conversation is this that you have uh, with one another as you walk and in, in, in you're sad? Then one whose name was Cleopas. Now, one of the Marys at the cross is married to Cleopas. It is believed that Mary, the sister of Mary, the mother of Jesus, was married to Cleopas, who is the brother of Joseph. I'm telling you, this just... Can you imagine trying to draw this family tree out? It would uh, it, it'd go off in all directions. It is believed that Cleopas is Joseph, Mary's husband's brother, and is married to Mary's sister. Cleopas is also called Alphaeus, and that even makes it more confusion. And they are the parents of James the Lesser. So there you have it. That clear to you now? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Then one whose name was Cleopas answered and said to him, are, are you the only stranger in Jerusalem? And have you not known the things which have happened there in these days? My goodness, let me tell you what has happened. And he said to them, what things? So they said to him, the things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how the chief priest and the other rulers delivered him, condemned him to death and crucified him. But we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Our hopes were dashed. Indeed, besides all this, today is the third day since these things happened. Yes, and certain women of our company who arrived at the tomb early this morning, one of them being my wife, I just put that in there. When they did not find his body, they came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. And certain of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but he wasn't there to see. And, and they said to them, oh, and then Jesus said to them, O oh, foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe in all the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into His glory? And beginning at Moses, all the prophets, He expounded to them in all Scriptures the things concerning Himself. Now, that little bitty verse of Scripture right there, verse 27, we just fly over that. Can you imagine how long this took? Y'all think I get a little long-winded every now and then? You can get me talking about certain subjects, and I can go on for hours. But I guarantee it was nothing like this. 
He starts at Moses and all the prophets. And He expounded to them in all the Scriptures the things concerning Him. Yeah, it took more than a minute. Then they drew near to the village when they were, where they were going, and He indicated that He would have gone farther. But they constrained Him, saying, Abide with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is far spent. And He, and he went in to stay with them. Now it came to pass, as He sat at the table with them, that He took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them, and their eyes were opened. Apparently, there was a manner or a way that he did that, that they, that's him. That's him. You know, like on the night before he was betrayed. And they said, well, and then, the, then their eyes were open, and they knew him, and he vanished from their sight. And they said to one another, did not our heart burn within us while we talked with us on the road, and while he opened the Scriptures? So they rose up that very hour. That very hour. Now this is evening time. They're compelling him to stay with them because it's late. And so, I mean, when this happened, they got up right then and went back to Jerusalem and found the eleven, those who were with them gathered together, saying, The Lord is risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. And they told about the things that had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. Now, the two men on the way to Emmaus, one of them is named Cleopas or Alphaeus, same person. The other one, I believe, is Luke, the writer of this gospel. Luke was one of the 70. Cleopas was one of the 70. And I believe it was the two of them that were there talking uh, about this, is, this account is only in the gospel of Luke. Luke says there were two people and he doesn't name the other person. I believe the reason he doesn't name the other person is because it was him. Now, as they were told these things, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and said to them, Peace to you. But they were terrified and frightened and supposed they had seen a spirit. And he said to them, Why are you troubled and why do you doubt arise in your heart? Behold my hands and my feet, that I myself... Uh, that it is I myself handle me and see for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. But while they still did not believe for joy and marveled and said to them, have you any food here? So they gave him a piece of broiled fish and some honeycomb. He took it and ate it in their presence. And then he goes into the great commission here in Luke's gospel. Now, I believe what is happening here is I believe that Jesus is appearing to people and revealing to them the Old Testament Scriptures about the Messiah and how it's been fulfilled in Him. So that they will have great confidence that He is, in fact, the Messiah. Listen, if He had, if he had been raised from the dead and seen by just the women folk that came to the tomb, and those were the only ones that saw Him, and then He went to heaven and didn't come back? How thick do you think the New Testament would be? It would have very... It had been very thin is what I'm getting at. There wouldn't have been much to it. Because it would have been very easy to dispel what those women had said. They would have been written off as crazy. Well, they were in horrible grief. They loved Him so much. They, they, they hallu you see, we have what, what's called these group hallucinations, and that's what they experienced. They had a group hallucination. And nobody would have believed. But with him appearing to over 500 people, with him appearing here to Luke and, and Alphaeus, and him appearing to his disciples and others, there is no way that people could deny. And it wasn't just for one day and gone. It was for 40 days, over a month, that they saw him every day. Next week, we're going to continue on this with some more information and lead into what happened on the day of Pentecost. Amen? Amen.
Thank you so much for being here today, joining our service. My desire for you is that God's richest and best are yours. And remember, there's victory in Jesus. Amen. As I tithe and give offerings, I'm believing the Lord for vision and direction, jobs, better jobs, raises and bonuses, benefits, sales and commissions, favorable settlements, estates and inheritances, interest and income, rebates and returns, discounts and dividends, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, finding money, bills paid off, bills decreased, blessings and increase. Thank you, Lord, for meeting all my financial needs that I may have more than enough to give into the kingdom of God and promote the gospel of Jesus Christ. And if you agree with that, say amen.